Hi, I'm Dalen Zartman, President of Rescue Methods. I want to welcome you to this month's production of uh, For Fire Rescue On, in which we're starting the first segment of a multi-series where we're taking a look at um, rescue events, particularly vehicle extrication, that involve multiple disciplines. Um, so you may have a vehicle into a ravine, you may have a vehicle into a pond, or you may have a vehicle into a building. In any one of those applications, more times than not, we have to address the environmental event, whether it be that pond or water-based issue, whether it be that high angle application, or whether it be the, the structural integrity of a structure, um, we've got to evaluate those things and mitigate, manage, or monitor the condition of those, of those elements prior to jumping into our vehicle extrication operations. So with this production in particular, we're going to focus on that scenario that involves a vehicle impacting a building, compromising the structural integrity of the building, and making that access point to the vehicle unsafe. When we immediately identify that, we've got to have some rapid interventions or some quick options that are affordable, fast, and easy for us as firefighters and emergency personnel to be able to safely and effectively shore up that structure so that we can gain access to the vehicle and start our extrication operations. Okay, uh, one of the initial things that we can pre-construct and pre-mark and store on our apparatus for quick deployments of spot shores is our headers and soles. So when we're talking about spot shore applications, for the majority of our shores, we're gonna use a 36 inch header and sole of four by four dimensional timber. Uh, what we wanna do is we wanna find the center point of these headers and soles, and we wanna go ahead and mark them. <clears throat> There's some other basic equipment items that we should have intact uh, or with us when we get ready to erect these shores. Um, and it's a really simple package of equipment or some, some basic tool accoutrement that you can take with you when you're uh, establishing these shores and pressurizing them in place. So one of those items is a hammer. It needs to be an adequate hammer for driving nails. Um, some of the shores that we're going to get into today, the mechanical pneumatic shores, have specialized hammers that are designed to tighten or, or pressurize the collars on those shores um, or on those struts. And those hammers often can serve the dual purpose of driving nails through the base plates into the headers and soles. But you need some type of hammer. You also need some fashion of level. Um, a quick, cheap torpedo level is effective. You can also use higher end digital application levels um, that have other applications for more advanced shores in them. But either way, just a simple level that's gonna give you a distance uh, or a decent length read on the shore to ensure that it's level when you're um, installing it. Speed squares are always a good uh, uh, piece of equipment to have with you when you're erecting shores. Uh, particularly when you're doing layout and making your markings, you want to make sure that um, any line markings that you're putting on the headers and soles are clean, straight, and neat, perpendicular to your outside edges so that we get good marriage contact points between vertical um, shoring component and horizontal shoring components. You also need a marking utensil, a tape measure, and some 16 penny nails. For training applications today, we're going to be using duplex nails just so that we have the ease of being able to remove them. But when you're installing these shores in a uh, real application, it's important to denote that um, for most of the applications where we're driving nails through gussets or any of those other applications, we want single headed nails um, that we're driving full depth. On the headers themselves, <clears throat> when we get ready to uh, pre-mark these for the applications of our spot shores, we're going to go ahead and take our tape. <clears throat> We're going to put it on one end, and we're going to pull a measurement. We should ensure that we're at 36 inches, which we are. Then we're going to find that center point, which is 18 inches, and we're going to make a mark there. Once we've made that basic mark, we can then take our speed square, line our speed square up with that mark, and make it more definitive. It's important that this mark is something that's not going to dissipate or go away. So using Sharpies um, or good colored marking crayons are good applications. The marking crayons will dissipate over time, um, but just make sure that it's something that's clearly denoted and easy to recognize when you pull it out and get it ready to uh, erect and, and construct your shores. So those are the basic pre-assembly components for the mechanical pneumatic type spot shores. Um, if we're getting into the Ellis applications with screw jacks um, or Ellis clamp shores, 
then obviously we're constructing half portions of T-shores and then uh, we're assembling those in various applications that we'll get into here momentarily. But the pre-constructed header and sole are just some easy components that you can easily store in a compartment on the truck and have them ready to go for your mechanical pneumatic spot shores. Okay, when we get into our mechanical pneumatic struts, um, it's important that regardless of the manufacturer, you know the working load limits of those struts, how that working load limit correlates to the uh, length of that strut, you know the rules on extensions or accessories that you can attach to the struts, as well as the operating mechanics behind the struts. Okay, so for the applications today, we're going to utilize this opening into the gear room to simulate a breach point or an area where a vehicle has careened through this wall and compromised this wall system. We have an existing header that's intact here because this is an engineered opening, but if not, we'd simply have a cinder block base here that would add any margin of degradation and compromise depending on what the vehicle did to this block wall. So we want to evaluate this area and approach it with extreme caution, especially when we're dealing with masonry type walls. Uh, we want to ensure that if this wall is, is unstable and we do have some loose debris or what they might call widow makers, which are components or elements that are hanging on tentatively um, and can come down and, and injure us, approach this area with extreme caution when you're taking your vertical measurement. So we're going to take our tape, we're going to go from ground all the way up to the top side of that opening and we're going to get that overall vertical measurement. In this application we've got just over seven feet. Uh, we've got 87 inches which correlates to seven foot three inches. Once we have that overall vertical measurement we're going to subtract seven inches from that overall vertical height. Subtracting the seven inches removes the dimension of the header and sole which are three and a half inches each. Once we've taken that seven inch increment out of that overall vertical height, we now have a working length of what we need um, in, of compiling struts, extensions, and base plates uh, to, to obtain that desired length component. To quickly calculate what that seven inch subtraction is and reduce the human margin for making errors in calculating that factor, simply double your tape measure back Bring the tip of your tape measure back to your overall vertical measurement, which was 87 inches, and then look on the low side or the tail tape side until you get to that seven inch mark. Look directly across on the other side and you're gonna see that the seven inches correlates to exactly six foot eight inches or a total distance length of 80 inches. Once we've got all that, that known number of what we want lengthwise, we can assemble the shore, we could pre-nail the base plates to our headers and soles and simply walk the shore into place, get it upright, lightly pressurize it, and then we're going to put our levels on it, ensure that it's plumb, and then finish pressurizing it. So we'll go through that segment step by step here. Okay, with base plates attached, this strut is basically a four foot to six foot strut. So I'm looking for an overall length of 80 inches. So by taking this strut and attaching a two foot extension to it, I'm gonna be well within the range of trying to accomplish that 80 inch vertical height. When you assemble these and make your extension selections, you wanna make sure that you're not choosing uh, too short of a extension or too short of a strut that is gonna require the strut to basically be almost completely stroked out before it hits your objective. You wanna make sure or try to ensure that you've got lots of playroom within your strut lengths uh, when you're assembling them for lengthwise. So we know that desired length, we know what parts and pieces we're gonna utilize, so we're gonna go ahead and assemble this strut and extension mechanism. Again, once we've got it in place, we just pop it down and the green detent button comes out. We, I now have my strut and my extension assembled and now I'm gonna work on my base plates. Uh, I believe that for the temporary shore applications, it's a little easier to take your base plates and pre-assemble them to the headers and soles rather than placing them on the strut system um, and then trying to nail your headers and soles onto it. So now that we've got our strut and extension done, we're gonna set that to the side and we're gonna work on getting our base plates attached to our headers and soles. 
Okay, once we've got our header and our sole pre-configured with our base plates, and remember, this is a rapid application. We've got the vehicle under the structure. We're trying to throw in a quick spot shore or a series of quick spot shores so that we can gain access to that vehicle. Um, you want to make sure that this whole shoring operation is driven by the victim. So it's imperative that in that initial size, if we're trying to get a picture painted of the condition of the victim, how rapid of an extrication is required, and then we're uh, analyzing or managing, managing our safe access to that victim and making appropriate shoring decisions from there. So once we've got these two built, we're gonna rapidly take the sole, we're gonna place it into the area where we want to erect that shore. Once that's in place, we can then take our strut, stand it upright, get our header, and simply attach our header to the strut. Once that header's in position, we can now walk this assembly over, drop it into place. You can see that we've given ourselves plenty of room with the uh, stroking capability or the extending capability of this strut. Once it's in place, we're gonna simply make sure we put a foot on the sole and extend this strut up until we have contact. The nice thing about the Rescue Techs are they self-lock that every 1 25th of an inch. So once it's in position, we can give it a couple quick turns to lightly pressurize it. We replace our torpedo level on the side of the strut and we can very readily see that we're out of plumb going to one side. So we can simply shift this strut back. We're level on that side. We can now check the other plane and we're leaning a little bit forward. Having a hammer and striking those headers or soles once it's lightly pressurized will help jog these into position. We also want to analyze um, the plane or the angles on our headers and soles and ensure that those are lined up. Depending on this wall system and what we're trying to shore, it's important that you have some basic education about structural collapse and how your headers and soles need to be oriented to the structural members that they're trying to support. So typically speaking, if we've got rafters or joists or something along those lines rather than a linear header like this, we, we have to make sure that this header component of our shore is running perpendicular with those compromised um, joists or rafters. All right, once we've got this in place, it's plumbed and it's lightly pressurized, we're gonna finish the pressurization on it. So this is where we're gonna use those specialized hammers designed for the struts. They're all interchangeable, so the Rescue Tech strut works on the Paratech, or the Rescue Tech hammer works on the Paratech struts. The Paratech hammer works on the Rescue Tech struts. Um, you can even use spanners in these applications to get these collars to turn. So just ensure that you've got that hammer and then we're gonna go ahead and pressurize this. All right, so for that final pressurization, we're using a Paratech hammer in this application. You can see that it has a tooth, much like a spanner, where we're gonna insert that tooth into the collar itself and we're gonna go ahead and apply pressure, ensuring that we lock in the top segment and that we further pressurize the strut. When you start to spin the entire strut, that's when you're at about max pressurization. You only want to pressurize these to the point that they're loaded and that there's no wiggle in them. Uh, if you overpressurize these struts at a vertical shoring application, you can displace the load, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, and you can have further collapse or secondary collapse based on your actions on the strut. So ensure when you're applying this pressurization that you have an officer, a shoring team leader, or a safety officer analyzing the load and ensuring that we're not shifting anything. Once the strut's in place, you've now made this area marginally safe for access to the vehicle. Okay, now we're gonna get in, into the Paratech systems uh, for struts and quick spot shores. There's uh, two basic components of Paratech struts that we're gonna use in a structural collapse operation. Um, it's the gray Acme threads and the golds. Um, the gold system and the gray system are all interchangeable with base plates. 
but the struts themselves and the extensions that, that go with these struts need to be kept the same in a colorized application. There's also some important notes to make about the markings on these struts and how they correlate to getting that sizing configuration that we're looking for. So we're gonna follow the same principles that we discussed with the Rescue Tech strut about ensuring that we assemble struts and extensions such that that throw or that desired length that we're looking at is well within the intermediate or short range of that strut and extension assembly. We don't wanna be maximally stroked out uh, to be trying to capture that, that void space that we're trying to get. <clears throat> On the grays, they're all marked in inches. So you can clearly see um, that in the inching components, this strut in particular is a 37 to 58 inch strut. Again, there are some variables with that length depending on what types of base plates I apply to this strut, but that's our general length throw, 37 to 58. Uh, on the golds, we also have the inch markings, which is 72 to 1 to 16, but one of the other added features of the golds um, are these additional general nomenclature markings, which are 610. Um, there's also uh, 305s and 406s, um, and those all denote basic foot markings. So the 610 strut is a six foot strut that extends all the way out to 10 feet. Um, now that we've covered the basic nomenclature, all the working load limit applications also apply. These have the same type of load charts on them um, with four to one safety factors. So we need to look at those, um, correlate those safety factors or the two to one safety factor, uh, whichever one we're gonna utilize. And then we're going to base the working load limit of this strut uh, on the load that we're trying to support and make sure that those correlate before we start assembly. We've covered all the basic uh, engineering capacities and the, the, the markings on these. Now we need to talk about the operating features. So the Paratex struts or the Acme thread struts between the golds and the grays basically extend out and then once they're at the desired length that you're looking for, you simply spin the collar down and it holds the strut in place. To pressurize it, you apply the wrench to the collar just like we did on the Rescue Tech strut and you apply torque or rotations to this collar which extends the strut up and captures that load um, and pressurizes it into place. The gold and the gray acne thread have the exact same application for extending. Uh, a couple other important features are the ends of these struts. So um, on the grays and the golds, on one end, which is the collared end, you have a receiving hole. That hole is designed so that when you drop the base plate on, it's got a locking pin and you need to rotate that base plate until the pin drops into position in the hole. On the opposite end of this strut, it's scored all the way around. So when we pay, place our base plates on this end, as soon as it drops in place, we don't have to rotate the base plate because the pin will just drop into that receiving slot. So those are important components to denote um, as far as ensuring that your base plates fully attach to each end. Um, and that's it for the operating applications. So we're gonna apply that same vertical span that we did with the Rescue Tech strut, subtracting that three and a half and three and a half inches for header and sole, resulting in seven inches, giving us an overall desired working length of 80 inches. Okay, so with, with our overall desired vertical throw of 80 inches, we've taken a strut that is a 37 to 58 inch strut um, basically giving us three foot at its uh, shortest point and giving us about five feet at its longest point. Um, we've then added a 12 inch extension and a two inch, uh, I'm sorry, a 12 inch extension and a two foot extension or 24 inch extension resulting in three feet, which is our maximum rule. Um, this is gonna give us a throw that is well within the range of 80 inches. We'll be marginally stroked out to capture that 80 inches and have plenty of room left. So our strut and extensions are assembled. Now we're gonna analyze our base plates, get those pre-configured to our headers and soles. It's important to denote if you develop a cache of struts like this and you have enough base plates that you can have your headers and soles already pre-configured and ready to go, it's just gonna speed up that rapid shoring application that much, that much more, that much more efficiently uh, when, it, when it comes to a scenario like this where you've got that vehicle into a structure. Okay, with the Paratex, you see that there's a little different configuration here than the Rescutex because all the extensions go on one end of the strut 
So your collar and your threaded or extending element of the strut system is always gonna be at the top or at the bottom. It's never gonna be intermediate like it could potentially be with the Rescue Tech. There's some thought processes about how you organize this or how you orient it when you put it into place. If it's at the top and you extend your strut out and spin your collar down, the only possibility of difficulty that you're running into with this application is that this could potentially be relatively out of your reach or difficult to manage if you have a really lengthy strut, such as the 610 with an extension on it, something along those lines. But keeping this threaded element at the top makes it very easy to operate when you're walking it into place. <clears throat> this inner chamber or this threaded element of the Paratech strut can completely slide out of this outer sleeve. So if we invert it or when we're transporting it around, it's imperative that we manage this bottom end to ensure that it doesn't fall out of the strut. So if we were to reverse this and make this our sole, then when we're walking this into place, we have to ensure that we manage this bottom sole plate. If we don't, it'll simply fall out of the strut. So both important considerations to, to identify before you're ready to place this in and attach your header. <clears throat> We've got our sole in place. We're gonna walk our strut into position. We're gonna get it vertical up. We're gonna pull back on that nose pin. Let that drop into place. Once our strut is in place, we're gonna extend it up until we contact that area. We're gonna spin our collar down. We're gonna get some light pressurization. Once it's lightly pressurized, we're gonna evaluate our headers and soles. Make sure that they're in line with one another. Look at them front to back. Make sure that our gaps are the same if we've got a wall to work off of. And once we've got it generally where we think it needs to be, then we're gonna get out our torpedo level. We're gonna check plumb on both planes. Strike our headers and soles. Once we're where we need to be, <clears throat> we're gonna take our wrench, again, apply it to our collar, stabilize everything manually, tension that collar into place, until we have pressurization of the strut and there's no wiggle in it. Again, very, very rapid, quick, um, and easy to operate and assemble spot shore application. Okay, in this application, we've taken a gold, which is a 610, that's six foot to 10 foot span on throw. We don't need any extensions because that 80 inch margin or just over seven feet that we're looking for is well within the short range of this strut. We've also configured the header uh, differently on the gold to show you the variables between how you orient your collar and your thread element on the strut. So this time, our header is on the fixed end of the strut and the sole is gonna be on the traveling end of the strut. So when we pick this up and walk it in place, it's imperative that we mine the bottom of this so that it doesn't play out. We can use the exact same base plates as the grays. So we're gonna walk this into place get it into position, pull back on our pin. Now remember on this bottom side, we've got to rotate the strut until that pin pops into the receiving hole. Once it's in place, we can get our header oriented the way we want it. We can extend this strut up. Once it's about where we want it to be, instead of spinning the collar down, we're now spinning the collar up. There are some thought processes with this application regarding gravity and secondary um, collapse or aftershock applications. And the theology is that potentially, if we get a lot of vibrations or tremors in the structure, um, and this strut is oriented this way, that the collar could in theory begin to thread down the strut. Um, but most of the Paratech regional trainers and most of their documented um, 
components ensure that when this is loaded and has the pressure on the collar, that the likelihood of that vibrating loose are very, very slim to none. Um, and for most of our applications, at least what we're discussing today, we're not talking about aftershock uh, type of occurrences. We're talking about uh, temporary shore, spot shore applications um, where the secondary collapse is not a, a tremendous concern um, from that type of natural environment or, or earthquake type of application. So, same principles, once it's in place, we're gonna visually kind of get it in the ballpark or where we need it to be. Once we've got it basically where we want, we're gonna use our speed or our torpedo level again. Check all the possible planes on the shore or on the strut. All right, once we've got it where we want it to be, then we're gonna take our wrench. We're gonna apply our wrench to the bottom collar and we're gonna apply some minimal torque until the strut is pressurized and doesn't wiggle. It's also important to denote um, with any of these applications with the spot shores that we have good marriages between um, stable construction product and headers and soles. So if this is the uh, base element that we're utilizing to support this sole, we want to ensure that we don't have an uneven plane underneath this sole plate, that there's not a lot of mortar or debris or anything along those lines. You need a very structurally sound base for this sole plate to work off of. Additionally, at the header, um, we want to make sure that we have a good marriage between header and whatever this wall system is. We don't want a lot of deviations and gaps. If you do have some deviations, you can shim or use some quick wedges, um, but if you don't have a clear plane to support or stabilize here, you're getting into some much more advanced shoring applications where these type of spot shores may not be effective and your knowledge base or your capabilities for shoring have to be exponentially greater than a crew that can simply apply these quick rapid shores. Okay, so to summarize all these spot shore applications, it's important to understand that the theology behind the spot shore is a very rapid, um, short-term intervention to help um, reduce the likelihood of collapse. There are rules to every one of these temporary shores driven by the manufacturers as well as the Army Corps of Engineers. So for every one of these shoring applications, it's imperative that you reference your SOG or FOG manuals, that you thoroughly understand all of the manufacturer's guidelines regarding the strut um, or the type of mechanical application that you're utilizing for your shore and that you apply it appropriately and correctly. Um, I hope that we've given you some tools uh, for some fast, effective, and rapid ways to kind of pre-assemble some of these components and make some viable rescues utilizing these applications in a much safer fashion than just charging into that compromised structure and starting extrication operations with a building, a roof system, a wall that are potentially gonna collapse on that crew and cause a lot further harm and damage uh, than what's already occurred.